Dominic Schmidt who, uh, who worked on this. He should have been here today, but uh, surprisingly he uh, preferred to take his uh, already booked long holiday in an exotic location. <laughs> Luckily, or actually that's how we do it, Kay and I worked fully with him on this project as a team, so we know what we're talking about when we just do the slides. <laughs> and um, also I have to warn you, uh, it's a work in progress. It's going to be no magic bullets and finished mock-ups of God of War. Uh, it's going to be uh, rough and ready what we, uh, what we present. The project isn't small. It's got a it's got a large scope, and uh, to do projects of this way, you have to do it uh, in a structured way. I say it's the only way, and it's exactly also this structure that is our story today. So we're gonna jump straight in into uh, into step one. For something this big, uh, a sizable chunk of GIP, GIMP is what you're uh, what you're talking about. Uh, I really wanted that we created a vision for it and what is a vision is simply uh, defining what it is you're working on, who it is for and what value it should actually bring. This has been done ages ago for GIMP itself but in this case to guide us I wanted to, I wanted to have one of these. So inside this we encapsulated many things. First of all the overall vision for GIMP of what it is and who it is for, uh, input from developers, the future of GIMP, so the whole gaggle uh, story that we're going to hear about right after this. Uh, and we did a user survey, uh, which really we tried to find and distill out of everything that came back there uh, the essence of, uh, of working with text. So I'll just present you the points of the vision, short statements, you read them yourself, I give annotations. Um, so this one really puts text in place. Uh, text in game is never the end goal. And as you see, there's a separate note and it's also a separate workflow. And this is something that came straight back out of the user, uh, the user input. Yeah, annotation is something that belongs to this. But it's sort of a, a side project for this whole thing. Um, Yes, there's. I love this statement. First part came from Dominic. Second part came from uh, came from Kate. Uh, really, put some some breaks on what uh, what text actually is. There's nothing page related, and paging is a verb. It means managing and working with pages. Uh, there's no such thing. This one puts these both aspects text information, text reading, and graphical shapes on the same level. This is also really a context thing for GIMP, uh, what it is about. Second part is about automated workflows, uh, auto layouting kind of stuff. Yeah, great for professional desktop publishing, but that's not GIMP. And here uh, we get to the, the value section. Uh, one thing we really learned from user, the user input is that the essence of typography is getting every glyph exactly, and they mean exactly, in the right place, in the right size, etc. So, the most minute control is uh, is asked for. It's also realization of how widely GIMP is used. Uh, it sets us really like, well, it has to do quote unquote everything, uh, but. And this everything has to be usable everywhere. So if you sit here in Vienna and want to do Chinese characters, Japanese, or God knows what kind of script, it should all well also work. And uh, But put some real limits on it. It's just the Unicode world, and that's where it stops. Anything more obscure than that, uh, it's going to be, well, I don't think so. So it's a big field, but it's at some definite borders. This encapsulates simply the gaggle dream edit forever. Uh, no matter how many hundreds of treatments you did on top of your text, you just select it, change it, change the typography, and it updates. As simple as that. Sounds simple, a lot of work. Uh, it also, on the other side, is about real life workflows where, um, yeah, the text is never finished, and maybe even after doing the first print run or putting out the first graphics, it's still not finished. And uh, 
so it's very important to um, that this remains editable forever, changeable forever. And the last bit, GIMP is for one third about production work, and this needs to be fast. Lots of stuff needs to be done in a short amount of time. But that's a trade you learn, and that's the other side of it. Here's everything together. Uh, short statements, simple points, but it knocks the whole project into shape, and that's the point of a vision. Uh, it really helps us to not run into aimless discussions about nuts and bolts, and what about this, and my grandma does that, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's what it's for. Uh, it's short, it's a tool. And that was the first step in the project, and now I'm going to hand over to Kate. Hello. I'm taking over the middle part of this talk. I'm like the, the meat in the sandwich. Um, so I'm going to talk about the next few steps we took. And um, the first, the next step we always take is uh, looking at functionality. So we have our vision, which is uh, guides us in this. Um, when we talk about functionality, this isn't UI. This isn't about the tools. This is just simply what it's going to do. Um, we so if you if you do want to look at the full list, I'm not going to talk about it now. Obviously, that's the link. Um, at this point, we did start to put it into um, organize it a little bit. So we have titles like annotation, text boxes, rulers, typography, open type, etc. Um, the next step is to do scenarios. So um, again, it's a build up. We've got a functionality. We've got um, we've got the vision, and um, the scenarios that we do are kind of narratives, different ways in which people use the software. It's um, based on the GIMP scenarios that we made for the for the um, application over, overall. Uh, we have. The first one, photographer. This is, um, yeah, this is normally, this is about maybe using text to add information to uh, images. Not necessarily to be seen, They um, and they need to be able to be turned on and off. So this is really, this is looking at workflow. Um, the next one is, yeah, obviously creating original art is uh, the major part of users uh, how people use GIMP. So um, in this case, we're looking at text as graphics. So this is not necessarily about things which are going to be readable. It's looking at things which are experimental and creative. It's going to be high levels of transformations, high levels of effects. Um, next one is text as information. So this is something which came really a lot out of the user feedback. People were saying, you know, well, I, I might have an image and then I want to turn it into a poster or something. So this is where we, we, you look, it's going to be about more about typography, about keeping it readable. Um, so that's that scenario. We have icon design, which is smaller. It's going down to the glyph level. And um, we have uh, the production level, as Peter was saying, this is where you might have automation. Um, it's going to be about optimizing it for export to the web. And so you can see we've got kind of, we've met, managed to break it up into different ways in, in which people are going to use text in GIMP. Um, the next step for us is always um, an evaluation. And this is really just lots of information gathering, looking at the state of, of text as it has in GIMP at the moment, looking at uh, all the other programs that that we think are applicable, like Photoshop and Inkscape and Scribus. And really, this is, yeah, again, it's a build up because we have the functionality, we have um, the scenarios now. So we're always filtering when we're looking at things, we're always fil filtering it through that information. But um, it's uh, mainly about what we can learn um, and and we're, and evaluating, obviously, hence evaluation. And so um, evaluation was really the end of what we call the project phase. And um, now we're at this point where we've got loads of information. You know, we've got 
lots and lots of stuff to look at. We've got to process it all. And the analysis for us is really the beginning of design in terms of we're searching for some sort of model in order to go forward. And so um, to that effect, I'll show you. I'd be, you don't really need to be able to read this, but maybe you can read a little bit of it. But um, this is one of the early sketches we made with Dominic, um, which is starting to sort out how people use text into various different you know, we're starting to break it down and look at different areas. So we have creation and editing and typography and layouting and text area definition and, uh, yeah, manipulation. And then we're starting to break it down and look at relationships. And um, to that end, we came up with the first kind of model that we came up with, which is uh, obviously we've got the text, we've got simple layouting, simple placement, and we've got more complicated manipulations. And, um, yeah, we, we saw it at this point as some sort of build-up of complication, which gave us a problem because it was far, it was too hierarchical and it just wasn't going to be flexible enough when we, when we filtered it through GIMP users, it just wasn't going to be flexible enough. So, um, we, changed that or into a, a more circular um, non-hierarchical model which was more about creating uh, as it says there which is yeah all the ways in which you you can make text within GIMP the placing and the mani and manipulating but instead of it being a build-up of like oh it's getting more and more complicated it was it's a more cyclical uh, relationship between the things, so you can always go back, and that's the point that we um, that we that we thought was very important within the model of how to go forwards. Um, so now we're really at the point where we can start to sum up all the things we've learnt, and we've come up with five major points, which. Um, we're calling the the building blocks for text handling in GIMP. So they are just you know they're the they're the they're the kind of Bausteiner as we say in German. Um, the first one, you know, there's no surprises there. It's text. Yeah, whoopie do. But um, it's uh, it's important in our concept that we have text as an entity that it's that it's something you know that exists within itself and all of, and, and has all of its parameters there. So, um, just to show you if that represents a line of text, which is just like I click and type, um, it's just going to run on forever there's, 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 until I put in a, a line break or a paragraph break and then I start to shape it now. Um, already within that, if you look at what's already encapsulated within that piece of text, you've got something which tells you where it is, so the little orange blob would be the coordinate. Um, it has, the area behind it is just to represent the fact that it already has its margins uh, in, within the text. Um, you'll see later why that's important. And um, yeah, so that's, and this is one of the, the building blocks that we're looking at of when we're working with the model of how to deal with text in GIMP. Um, the next major building block is uh, we call is vectors, or this is the text container, basically. Um, again, some text, and this time I've put it in a box. And again, you're like, yeah, well, yeah, it's a text box. But um, the thing that's interesting about this is, well, first of all, uh, how we make that it's uh you know it's orthogonal it's simple it's it's and it's the text and the container together um when we when we as as we pointed out before when when we make that into a more complicated vector shape because vectors can be as complicated as you want to make them um it works in exactly the same way you have your text container your vector container um, it's filled with text which is uh, you know the the container is now basically just the only difference is it's it's wrapping the text within the container um, but when you when you look at 
what that text is when you think of the text as an entity you see you know that some useful things about it first of all um you always have the orientation there which is important for internationalization um it's also important when you start adding um you know manipulating it adding effects editing it so for example when you start rotating it you we still know because we have text as an entity what's the top what's what's the left what's the right the bottom and it can always work together or independently with the vector because when we look at workflow um we realize there's so many different ways of doing th things things are never just a one way street um you can start anywhere you can put um you know you can start with the text put it in a vector you can start with the vector put it in a text you can um and yeah in in a simple state it will still be within you know this sort of a click and drag to make a simple box but what we're saying is that the approach is the same and um things obviously will get a lot more complicated and so peter's going to talk about that bit so for move on i it's really quite a day when we as a team uh realized and this may not come as such a surprise for people who work in vectors all the time but within gimp uh, it's something different that yeah at the end there is no difference between a text box and a vector and coming from either side uh, it's just a continuum and here it shows that the project just went broader uh, it started with text but now vectors which are by the way compared to the inkscape stuff we saw before uh, very primitive in gimp but uh, still confident it can be any shape and uh, yeah a real insight that now the whole vector thing was drawn into basically into the project or married to it uh, as we would like to say so now we're going to get bent um, warping of uh, of text with paths yeah it's a path morning uh, I believe so during the evaluation, and that's how the how the story goes, uh, we went through all the programs, GIMP and the other ones, uh, open source and proprietary. And yeah, while evaluating, we noticed that there's really a lot to be desired when you talk about putting text on a path or a path with text, etc. It's all bits and pieces, and uh, what was missing is really a system. So we couldn't help ourselves and started thinking about the system. So. These are more text, lines of text. It's not boxed in, although it looks like it's well behaved, but it's all done by returns. And uh, all the examples I do right now are left to right text. Later I get back to internationalization part of it. So let's have a path. And I thought it was not, shouldn't take a trivial S shape, but something a little bit uh, uh, complicated. And we thought like, okay, uh, path with path you can bend the lines which lines are these okay let's take first the ones that go in the direction of the text so in the direction that it's written and you can do something like that so not too difficult uh, notice that the path is not consumed by this action it is more or less copied and associated into the text block paths are in game really uh, mathematical definitions they don't display by themselves so and it's clear that what what you have the thing that is the result is is the texting the white thing uh, that you have there the path is not consumed by this uh, by this action now you can ask uh, so you were bending a line which line is that the answer is all of the above um, each one of these lines will give different results users should simply say which line it is they're bending when you do input of that, uh, it also sort of settles the, the question of, so where are you going to measure your tracking and your kerning, etc. We think that a good start is along that line, actually, to do that. This will get give predictable results. So happy with that, along the lines. So what's left, OK, perpendicular to that, across the lines. So where are the candidates for that? And uh, also informed by how some of this stuff works in the, in other programs uh, we're like well you know you got these you got these lines that you use for text alignment left aligned middle aligned right aligned so 
let's start bending those. Simple enough uh, uh, metaphor to use, so right aligned, text lines, center aligned, left aligned. So, and here you already see a problem. This was all free, pure text, it wasn't boxed in, but what if it boxed in? For instance, here by the slide. Uh, and so you need to move on and say, okay, what's if, you know, it's text inside a shape, and let's have a shape. There's that pointy star again. Uh, making the slider realize that getting this to work like this, the path really needs to have an offset compared to the whole shape kind of a thing. It's something we uh, figured out by doing the slide. And yeah, the shape is nothing but a wrapper of the whole thing, just line wrapping, so that's what it does. And that's the result. Not very artistic, but <laughs> it. Uh, if you want to do this, you can. I hope everybody can imagine some really useful stuff they can do with this. I'm actually sure about it. Uh, but it shows that with a couple of simple pr simple concepts, you get a long way. It's not, you know, it's not rocket science where we done up to now. So we have two warps that are orthogonal. So cool, you can combine them. Bend the lines, then bend, bend it orthogonal to, uh, to that. And then we also realize that these lines that we are warping are attached to paragraph specs. The, along the lines is, uh, you pick the line that is also used for leading, uh, or that can also be selected for leading. And the alignment specification is always for a paragraph, left, middle, right aligned, just. So, hey, you can do that per paragraph. And then it gets more interesting. Uh, handling this for paragraphs is already there. It's simply how you handle text and set paragraph specs. Nothing like that's going to create a ton of UI design. And internationalization is back, of course. There are writing directions. Uh, the normal ones are left to right, right to left, top down. And once you got there with three, why not do the fourth one also, also bottom up? Uh, you know if you programmed in any way, just turn it around. Uh, and here, we're not only with internalization, but also creativity. Simply the power of combinations, I hope you can imagine. And as I said, not a ton of UI you have to use for this. Uh, you just have to associate the parts with, uh, with the actual paragraph, uh, specifying the things like the, which line it is and uh, the alignment the direction you take. And then the writing direction combines with that. It's not, I don't imagine 42 sliders to actually control this, uh, this kind of stuff. What we have here and what we sort of also discovered in the project is uh, yeah, what we named the meta model. What I described to you now is not like an interaction model because I haven't shown you any real interaction, have I? And uh, it's not a technical model because it's not like, let's see what's in the library and let's use that. It is sort of figuring out in a level in the middle of that like, how it can be, how how good it can be, and driving both sides from that. All of this was simply triggered by the evaluation that we did. We got the bottom out of it, we looked around, and then we found it uh, needing. So it's not about also like going through the applications, copy everything you see, put it all together, and let's, uh, let's do it. It was looking for an elegant model. Workflow-wise, uh, again, evaluation of programs, a lot to be desired. Uh, a lot of programs you can do some of this that I showed you. Some set some characters to a part in some way, uh, but only in one way. Some you have to start with the part, some you have to start with the text, and we are like, really? So we say, you can start anywhere. You can have a path and a text, made at different times, just put them together. You have a starting point to really you know, start working with warping. You have a path, you set some type to it, you got a starting point. It's indistinguishable from that moment, from the first starting point. You got some text, you take a path tool to it and start warping it, same, same result. So start anywhere, get to in this, into the state that a path gets associated with the text and take it from there. This is quite important and uh, is also quite a couple of steps more than the, uh, everything we've seen up to now. Although it's simple principles, isn't it? And we're already talking about tools. Just mentioned the path tools. So 
yes, it's tools, not one tool, it's not the text tool. We see now throughout the talk that it's, uh, we've seen the combination of things, text with vector, with, uh, with path, different aspects of it. And it's throughout our discussions with this, it's quite natural to have, uh, handle this with different tools. First of all, the text part, um, text tool, yes. It's a natural scope for all text and typography work, and it also, inside this context, you really have the chance to overload the, the keyboard shortcuts. I mean, they're all eaten up in GIMP. There's nothing really left for a keyboard shortcut, about nine of them, I believe, the freaky ones. And uh, so, but you know, if you create a text context and you're working with text, inside the context, you're liberated and you really overload a whole lot, so redefine it to do a lot of things by shortcuts. What is already being worked on, some bits on the code, some bits on the UI, is a simple, and I really say compared to Inkscape, simple uh, vector tool. Uh, throughout our discussions, every time we talked about the box and how to manipulate it and how to make it and how to make a really complicated one, it was like, oh, actually we're talking about a problem that is a design problem for the vector tool. You solve it there, you solve it in general, so it seems, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a natural that the simple, simple vector tool will take over all this part. Path tool is there, does the warping, enough set. Uh, you can simply take it to a text block and start bending it. I think that uh, should just uh, easy enough. And the last one is what's also coming up, Summer of Code project, combined geometry tool. Uh, I designed most of that. And, uh, you know, it does moving, sizing, rotation, shearing, and, uh, and free uh, free distortion of the of a block, and yeah, that's a natural to again operate on the, on the text block width. It's a very clear model. It's easy to explain. What do you want to do? Oh, it's a vector thing. Go to the vector tool, etc. Clear for users. Clear for us. Clear for our developers. What's not to like? Well, in the evaluation of all the programs, we noticed that there is a whole switch rama of working with text. Uh, multiple tools and sometimes really quite a few diff different tools have to be used to do what for users is one atomic task. It's simply doing one thing and then you have to, okay, text tool, some bit of a geometry tool, then another tool. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that cannot be. So, for instance, if you look this at this uh, vision statement, typography and layout, that's not two things. That's one combined thing uh, that means you have to be able to do it together. So what we need is cross-pollination, especially things from the uh, uh, combined geometry tools seeping into the other tools to do it on the spot there. Simply when from task analysis, that's logical. I know we're gonna add a a lot of feature requests on that because everybody has their favorite combination that they want to do together. The only thing in way to sort it out is to analyze the task and see, understand the whole activity and know what's atomic. And I was gonna give you a crazy example. You know, you're editing the path and somebody says, and at the same time I want to do kerning and thought, that's crazy, until I thought about it a little bit more and thought, no, when you're bending the path and you want to spread out the characters, it's exactly what you need to do together at that moment. It gets you the result. So it's a yes, we have to seriously look at it. Then I thought, can we, you know, can I make a counter example? Yeah, path editing and coloring every glyph. No, I don't see that as one atomic task and I don't think I can be uh, convinced of that. So that's going to be a solid no, that we're not going to make any effort to do that. We have no obligation to do that together. Final thing, back to basics, some text editing, just to close it off. Let's have some text on the canvas. Um, but wait, the vision says, you know, text is never by itself. It's in a context. So let's have a context. This could be a photo, could have been a collage. Uh, and yeah, working with text. The most natural thing when you say you work with it in context is, you know, put a frame around it. I made it orange so you all can see it. Uh, put a cursor there. There's a typo in it that needs to be, uh, need to be dealt with. And yeah, this, as a model, looked like the most natural thing to work with text on the canvas. Quite simple, and this should be the default in GIMP. 
But there is another factor, uh, and it's maybe the biggest factor in GIMP. It's an image manipulation program. So text and vector, never the end goal. There have to be some treatments on it. Now it's going to be, I'm going to ask you, can you still see the text? Hardly, no? Difficult. That's the point. So, yes, it's very vague already. It's also slanted, so it'd be not fun to work with, and that's that's where we want to go. So, yeah, ton of treatments on top of text. It's not that clear to work with anymore. So, what we need optionally is still the clean sheet editor. Do all the typography also in there, but as Kate always says, you have to be able to see the result on Canvas, so it should be out of the way and immediately update the canvas while you're doing stuff. Uh, apart from the typo, for instance, here, the kerning in the first word could use some love. So that's why you'd want to do the right here. Yo. Sorry. So, I hope you see here that the original and the result is both there? I know, yeah. Okay. Twice though, you're just you're just editing it in a white space, and it's and it's changing. Light. So, so it's just in, it's not always bad. It's just if you really can't see what you're doing. Updates in real time. Yeah. This is this is one thing. Yes, it works like this. Uh, well, it changed working like this. The old way is the box and the new way is uh, on the canvas, but really had to, from user's workflow and not from, gee, how can we program this, uh, we had to have a definite answer what is the best thing. So we don't want to put this on everybody forever. It's in lots of situations, it's nonsense to have this two-way thing. However, once you get to this stage, you got a ton of treatments, and this can go much wilder. I mean, it can really be twisted that you cannot see it anymore. Uh, you need this. So the default is the other one on the canvas in context, this when you need it, and but it's clear that it has to be there. So what I want to say, uh, the last thing is, uh, yeah, you see that even in design of the simplest thing, hey, it's just text editing, you know, uh, it, the design of it is heavily influenced by the context that you actually do it. This discussion of if it should be like this or that is winning GIMP. For any other program, you start again by looking at the whole context and solving it. I'm not saying that this is the best for everyone. End of the talk. Uh, we started with the vision, and all that we showed you during the talk is how we were driven by the vision in realizing it. Now, maybe some of you at the end say, still like, uh, yeah, you showed quite a bit of pictures, but where's the UI design? Can already touch it. And then I say to you, well, what I showed you is a big chunk of the UI design. It is the hard grunt work up front to get into a state where questions can be answered, actually, where design can be made, where things can be solved. So we moved ourselves out of position by just acting like the fire brigade. Oh, what about this and that? Have a look at what I've made, etc., and go to a situation where we now put everything in a proper relationship to each other. We have a basis to work from, and from here, uh, Kate always said, I shouldn't say it's downhill from here because it means <laughs> it's going to get worse, but it's all just going to be easy from Plain here. Sailing. Plain sailing is what it's supposed to be. So, and with that, as the outcome of the, of the first internship, we're very happy with these results and we'll take it from here. And that's the end of our talk. Thank you. I know I've overrun. By five minutes. So, any questions? Or we're just gonna get get on with the goat stuff. Uh, yo. Uh, is, uh, I would almost swear that. 
how to say this. I don't think that's even a factor a factor for us. I mean, anything just has to work. I do not I do not have to get into even assuming some of that. I'm simply the glyphs come out, it can be anything and it can be scripts we don't know. But as long as it's you know typographical engines work, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna provide a means to operate that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know it. Yeah, a couple of factors are flying through my head. Like, yes, we have to design the system. The system is, these is based on a lot of principles that are already there. And then it needs to have proper names to work with, uh, which have to be based on typography, uh, traditional typography, yes. But not sure whether there is so much friction, friction at this moment uh, with that. It's also detail where I can really easily say we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. yeah. What this is about is still about setting type. It's just getting type on the canvas. So it's not even about distorting type at this point. Even if you're distorting the box horribly, you're just setting the boundaries of the box differently. If you're warping the text along the path, you're just stringing the pearls of text along this path, and that's what it is. Anything in GIMP that has to do with freaky distorting stuff is, again, treatments over the text, and that's how it's defined. This is so the whole text system is a pure typographical system at that point. Yes, you can, you know, standard typography parameters for digital type is still, you know, setting independently the width and the height of each glyph, even after you set the size of it in the, in the font size. Uh, there is where you could do it, but I don't think that's a nice workflow to just go through everything and just increase the size bit by bit by bit, for instance. Uh, when you're talking to GIMP about stretching and warping things, you set the text, you get it into the position, you warp it with another tool, uh, ge geometry, pixel geometry changing tool, after which, because it's all the workflow, yeah, you can change the text again to react to that and get things in the right place, and then change the warping again, and the text again. That's the whole workflow of, you can always change things. But that's how, within a GIMP system, this works. In Inkscape, I would guess it would be really different because you put out the vector that's a whole context, you know, context is everything in this kind of stuff. Well, the answer is very simple. If the desktop environment has it, hell, why not? But uh, we're not going to, you know, are you going to build it? Am I going to build it? No, I don't think so. So it's simply, if it's standard, it's there. If the platform refuses it, then the platform doesn't have it. So why would we be more Catholic than the Pope? No, we don't. Uh, we don't have to. But it's you know, it ha it has to be made available by the desktop environment. I mean, it's a global thing. At this point, I say, who's next? <laughs> Mitch Pippin. Hmm? Still on the talk? Okay. So, thank you very much.